Thank you, Derek. So for the next half hour, we're going to sing a slightly different song. No exuberant enthusiasm about the cloud, but a very pragmatic look at its capabilities and uh, uh, challenges. Last year, I was on this podium in San Francisco, but I was uh, presenting cloud for cloud skeptics. That indicated an attitude that I had. I was so upset that I did the entire presentation last year without even ever using the word cloud except in the title. What I was trying to say was to uh, report on some uh, of my findings about uh, how we need to be cautious about how we approach the cloud computing environments because if we are not careful, we're going to find out that it is not only very expensive but also somewhat less performing than on-premise computing. We also, it is my job as chief scientist to challenge every large claim especially those of infinite capacity, for example, and I have so many times encountered limits in that claim. So uh, the special point of view that I take as I approach these new computing resources is the point of view of the job scheduler. At Altair, we have a family of job schedulers, so that's where our expertise lies. And the job scheduler is fundamental because it knows what you want to run and what are the computing resources you have to run that workload. How did we get to this? Okay, sorry, I'm pushing the wrong button, okay. So to be clear, I'm only talking about engineering computing, which is the type of computing we do here at EDA. I'm not talking about using the cloud for websites, for mail servers, we are talking about computing that is very intensive, that goes on around the clock, that's what we see in our customers, that uses very, very expensive licenses that we buy from the vendors here on the floor, and that also have a challenge in the large data footprint. The data footprint is always going to be a challenge when we need to move that data up, uh, front and left. But we do have expertise in this field. We are using, we have customers, that are using in three different clouds, using our Altair Accelerator, which is, by our metrics, the fastest job scheduler available commercially, and they use it, and they have used it in the past several years to design chips. So, something that I learned only a few weeks ago is the new term, it's called cloud repatriation. So there are organizations that have moved out to the cloud, have uh, been burned by some something, cost, performance, and now they're moving back. Now, this is not surprising for us skeptics. It's just a confirmation of one simple fact, that the cloud will not be the destination for all computing, but it is a very useful tool. It will be the destination for maybe a large part of the computing. But in order to be become that destination, we have to be careful about how we use it. So we believe that in order to use the cloud effectively, we have to look at uh, four proposals that we have. First of all, we fully expect that the majority of the people will have a hybrid solution. Some on-prem computation plus the cloud. We will suggest a concept here called the rapid scaling, which is not really a new concept. Scaling of the cloud has been a promise of the cloud for the past 12 years. We just want to do it as well as possible. We want to make, make you aware of a new problem, a new technology called file-aware scheduling, how we are going to look at the files and how they respond to the solicitation of the workload. And finally, you need to solve the problem of sharing your licenses, which could be on premise, on the cloud, across the world, and you want to share them with your uh, new cluster in the cloud. So why it's important to have uh, hybrid solutions? Because we are already designing chips. We are already using uh, scripts that work in our on-premise environment. And if we want, to move quickly to the cloud, we need to be able to use the same scripts. So this leads us to a couple of conclusions. We do need 
share filers when we are up in the cloud. And we need to try to reproduce the on-prem environment in the cloud. That's what we see our customer effectively doing. And this is important because the alternative would be to rewrite our applications to be optimized for the cloud. Will that happen? Maybe it will. It will take 20 years. So we need to do the designs now, this year. In order to do that effectively, we need share filers and we need to reuse the scripts. Rapid scaling is something that we at Altair are proposing to our customers because we are obsessed about efficiency. So one of the characteristics of uh, rapid scaling is that we want to put the cost of your computing infrastructure front and center, actually top left, but that's okay. Uh, it's the primary part, place. We want to respond to the demand as quickly as possible. The demand is the workload that is in your, has been submitted to your scheduler. We want to dynamically respond to the workload behavior in the existing infrastructure, and then we want to terminate the instances as soon as possible in order to reduce the costs. I will do the presentation in two videos. You have to pay attention because the videos move quickly. And the first one is a very basic uh, rapid scaling. In the second one, we will introduce licenses. So let's see if I can get the video to go. And uh, so I will present the video. So uh, using Altair Accelerator, which is the fastest scheduler available, we're going to show a better implementation of scaling. And on the top left, we are gonna see the cost. The blue cost is the infrastructure cost, the head node. The green cost is the cost of the computing resources. Here we're going to see the workload in many rectangles some monitors to see what's going on, and the computing instances are here, and then we're gonna use the shell to submit jobs. Now, maybe you notice the cost at rest is zero dollars because there is nothing to do. Now we're submitting a very simple workload of 300 sleep 30 jobs, the best demo tool available. The jobs are now waiting for hardware. In response to the request for hardware, the rapid scaler will request instances so here are the instances coming in, but it will take time for the instances to boot. Now we have five instances, but we are not using them. The jobs are still queued. Yeah, in fact, even the cost has not bumped up because AWS has not yet given us the resources. But very shortly, in a couple of seconds, we're going to see the cost starting to go up. We are now, you know, see it's bumping up. It's, it's already a dollar 41 cents and we are going to pay more and more for these instances which are still not usable. They're still booting. This is a kind of a tax we have to pay. We have to wait for all these 30 instances to boot before we can use them. And you see the cost is already $3 and we are using zero. Now, as soon as the instances connect, within milliseconds, the jobs start running, which is great. The orange jobs are the jobs that are running. We have a nice set of machines already connected. The others are still booting. And as you can see there, we are using the green cost of $2.55 is the cost of the computing part of the resources. Now something important is happening. We have hundreds of jobs in the queue, but we stop this requesting machines because the slope of the queue jobs is fast enough. The, the workload is moving fast enough. We don't need to increase the size of our farm. Now the farm is fully deployed. We are finishing the first workload. The farm is still warm. We can submit now another tiny workload like uh, some 300 jobs, again, sleep 10 jobs. Now because the farm is ready, the workload will not have to wait. Within milliseconds, the entire job are, are dispatched to our farm. And then you'll see there that we have the uh, little bump in the running jobs and queue jobs. But very important is that as soon as the machines become idle, one minute after they become idle, the cost drops down to zero, which is where we want it to be. Yeah, This is the, going to be the only way to save money out in the cloud. In the second video on our way, we have first uh, a summary. So how do we save you money 
by using rapid scaling. Here are the reasons why we will not request more instances. The scheduler will tell us that the workload is waiting for licenses. Licenses will always be a limitation. If the job is waiting for license, no new instances. Let's say the jobs are waiting for policies, like you have a max number of jobs for a user, yeah? So even if the user has a thousand jobs in the queue, no new instances. Something unique in our implementation, the workload is fast enough. So we have determined that we are actually going through the workload very quickly, will be done in a few minutes, no need to fire up more instances and to pay more dollars for hardware. And then there are things that we do because our customers want them. We are philosophically against putting limits on instance types or limits on budgets, but these are kind of sanity limits, and so we are supporting those as well. In the second video, we are going to do rapid scaling, but with licenses. What we want to do in general at Altair, we want to bring your licenses to saturation. This is the healthy state. You've invested many millions of dollars in uh, licenses. We want you to be able to use them all. Here we are using real tools from Altair, Compose and Hyperspice. We are doing uh, 10,000 Hyperspice simulation in this particular example. We are using the browser interface to invalidate and run a workload that we had already loaded in the scheduler. So you see here about 10,000 rectangles that represent the hyperspice and compose jobs. And in response to that request, we are now fi firing up some instances. Zero cost is where we're starting. And now we have 100 compose jobs in the queue. These are the jobs that generate the net lists for hyperspice. As before, we are requesting the license, the machines, but it takes about a minute and 20 seconds to boot an Amazon Linux instance. It takes like four minutes to boot Red Hat. As soon as the machines connect, the Compose jobs start running. They are generating the net lists, about 10,000 net lists for Hyperspice. And as soon as some of the machines are ready, then we are starting to run Hyperspice there. Um, yeah, we are waiting for all these machines to still boot, but you see, as soon as we connect, one millisecond after they connect, we start running jobs. So we are now spending, what, five bucks or eight bucks for this uh, particular dynamic farm. Something very important is about to happen, however. All of this workload is now hardware limited. But all of a sudden, we're going to see that it's limited by licenses. This is a very good situation. We want to be there. Also, especially as software vendors, we want our customers to saturate the licenses. You'll see that the blue line drops and the cyan line is now appearing. The licenses of uh, here, license ICC is the license for hyperspice. 200 licenses are fully saturated. The only way to go faster here is to buy more licenses. Yeah, that's what we want our customers to do. In response to that new behavior of the workload, we are realizing that we have too many instances, so we are immediately sharing that load and that cost in order to save money. Now, at the end of the workload, everything is done, and we want to wait that one minute for all the machines to go, to go away. So this is really a mechanism to control costs. Without these mechanisms, we have customers spending thousands of dollars per hour in instances that they launched and forgot. Yeah? Because it's so easy to launch, so easy to forget. A different topic, which applies to the cloud as much as it applies to your on-prem filers is the fact that filers can be stressed. So in a stressed filer like NetApp, ICLOAN, or EFS, or FSX will cause a tremendous delay to all the jobs that are actually working on that uh, filer. And the effect is very dramatic, and we'll show that also in a video. The idea is simple. 
we monitor the latency of the filer, and then we throttle the jobs that are running on that filer depending on how the latency is doing. And we have essentially a state machine that uh, evaluates itself every 10 seconds or less. And depending on the latency, it will be either in an open loop mode where we are running as many jobs as we can, more and more, or in a steady mode where we incrementally and prudently increase the number of jobs that we can run on the filer. In feedback mode where the latency is kind of between an intermediate range, a balance of stress and throughput, we're going to keep it there. Above a th certain threshold, we're going to get into preempt, preempt mode. That's where we want to start actually shedding the load on the filer in order to get the filer under control. The next video is uh, showing numerically the effect of uh, filer stress. So we actually are doing this on an old filer, so the numbers look a little odd, but the effect is very strong. So we are running more efficiently by running fewer jobs, yeah? That's kind of counterintuitive. You're not gonna go faster by running more jobs. Same characters as before, but we now have a latency monitor, which is around two milliseconds in at rest. Here, like before, we, work, we will show the workload, and now we are submitting 500 jobs that are very I.O. intensive. They are just writing a tremendous amount of data, but we are actually controlling that based on their effect on the filer. Because of the workload, the latency on the filer immediately jumps up to 300 milliseconds. Because it's that high, we are already in the S4 state, in the preemption state, so we are actually now limiting this workload. There are only about 10 jobs running, but they're running quickly. They are finishing very rapidly. So we are keeping the, the big holes under control. The second part of the experiment, we're running the same jobs, but this time without any control. It's the unmanaged workload. We have plenty of resources. We can run all 500 jobs in parallel. The latency jumps up, explodes, 4,500 milliseconds, more than four seconds. This is a very old filer. It's not behaving very well. The jobs are all running, but they're actually taking much, much longer. So the question is, how much longer? Is it a few percent? Is it a few times more? So here is the numeric report that you get from Accelerator. The managed workload ran for about three minutes and 10 CPUs. Okay. The unmanaged workload ran for three minutes, but 500 CPUs. So this job was terrible. The cost of that second workload was huge. One day and four hours versus 38 minutes. We are talking about a 50x effect of the filer on the workload. So this is something that is concerning the filer vendors and we are working with Dell to try to address this problem for the much newer filers where the factor is not 50, it's more like eight or so on the modern filers. Now, in our demo, we used the very abstract jobs that only write, file, write. But let's take you have a realistic job which has a lot of CPU intensive simulation and then only a small IO part. Now we've seen that the filer will impact the IO part in a great way. And that part can blow up by a factor of 30, 50 or something. So your job will actually be way longer and the license that the job checks out will be used for also way, way longer. So it looks like you're using the license, but in fact, the license is not used effectively. Last topic, allocating licenses. You don't know where your licenses are. You, know, you can negotiate new cloud licenses, but it's gonna take time. Your licenses today are on-prem. Yeah, you may have some new server on the cloud. You probably want to use both. And it's actually easy to route licenses from on-prem to the cloud using tunnels. It's not a challenge. It's not super fast, but it works. You can do that. The key thing is now you have 
demand for licenses in multiple places. You have on-prem guys wanting the licenses and the guys running on the cloud also wanting the licenses. So how are you going to manage that? Yeah, This is where license allocator, or now called Altair allocator, will be used to control the traffic, to police access to the licenses across uh, now across the globe. So I'm going to use this diagram, this table, to show what's happening. So let me explain this to you. We are only looking at two licenses, a simulation licenses and a DRC license. We have 20 and four licenses available total. Uh, we have two sites, one in San Jose, which is our on-prem, and one site in AWS. Now, you, maybe you have multiple sites in AWS, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. It would apply the same. Uh, the purple, the cyan jobs show how many jobs are queued, and it turns out that we have a thousand jobs wanting the simulation license in AWS. And so you'll see that the allocator will say, well, all those 20 licenses, we're going to move to AWS. In the case of DRC, we have 740 jobs in San Jose, so we are allocating two and two, yeah? And the little C symbol represents criticality. So it tells us that the workload on that site is actually waiting for license and not something else. So criticality is actually good in the sense that you know that you're using your licenses to saturation. Now I will tell a little story using these four panels. So let's see if I can do it in short order. Yeah, it should be a good time. Okay, at the beginning of the story, there is nothing going on in AWS. There is a little bit of workload on premise. And for example, there is one job running the simulation. This, I know, I put a long job running there. The remaining 19, the remaining, so we have uh, 20 licenses, and we are putting 11 in San Jose, and 9 in AWS. So AWS is ready to go with licenses if any load appeared. Um, San Jose is okay. For uh, DRC, we only have workload in San Jose. We have four licenses. All four licenses are allocated to San Jose, and that license is critical. In the second chapter, AWS wakes up. Somebody has submitted a thousand jobs that want the simulation in in uh, uh, in the in AWS. Now, because there is only one license in use in the whole world, we can easily immediately move 19 licenses over in the AWS, but these are not critical because we don't have hardware, yeah? We still need to wait for the hardware to wake up. By this way, the panels here are like a few seconds away, yeah, like 10, 20 seconds away. So we need to wait for hardware to be able to satisfy this workload with those licenses. In the third chapter, now we have moved all the licenses for the simulator to Amazon. Uh, we are starting to run. The licenses are, in fact, critical now, so we've reached saturation, good, yeah? And at the same time, we are still, oh, no, we have a new workload for DRC appearing in, uh, in AWS. Now, because we had all four licenses already being used in San Jose, we need to be careful when we move them. We need to wait for the jobs in San Jose to, to stop. So, we dial down from four to three the allocation in San Jose. We have one license moving, but that means we are waiting for the San Jose to finish one job. Only when that job is finished can we move, in fact, not just one, but we get to the balance already. So we do two and two because the weights between San Jose and Amazon are gonna be the same in this example. And in the meanwhile, we had plenty of hardware, we ran all the simulations very quickly. Okay, we, at Altair, we eat our own dog food. We are using rapid scaling to do the things that we don't normally do. For example, we are doing some uh, elements of car design, we do some uh, rendering, and we don't do rendering all the time, so we don't have the resources in-house, but using Amazon, we were able to 
use rapid scaling. We did like 22 days, week, uh, two weeks worth of rendering in just six hours with a farm of uh, hundreds of machines which had a nominal cost of a million dollars per year. But we used it only for six hours and we know how much we pay. We pay $360 for that particular run. So we knew exactly what was going on. So last year I was skeptic. This year I'm a pragmatist. That's not evolution, it's just self-marketing. It's much easier to be a pragmatist than a skeptic in a world of enthusiasts. But anyway, the message is let's be careful when we approach the cloud. The cloud can be super useful, but you have to be careful. We'll promote hybrid approaches with our customers. Rapid scaling will be essential for the customers to control costs. Filer aware scheduling will be useful everywhere. And license sharing is gonna be the way to use those licenses very effectively. So I'm here available for questions. We have a booth uh, at uh, number 910. We'll be available a little bit all day tomorrow for more questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure, questions, yeah. Of course, a lot of questions. Yeah, so, so one question I noticed. Oh, there is a pretty bad mic. Okay, let's just wait. Okay. So anyway, I mean, you should make scaling where you kind of look at what's going on. Do you differ? No good. Come over. <laughs> come over. I come there. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Very complicated way to ask a question. So anyway, I mean, you showed us this dynamic scaling where you kind of observe what goes on and then you scale dynamically. Do you also look at how different instances actually are variously good at running particular workloads? Do you assume everything is like homogeneous or if it turns out that certain nodes are better than other nodes at running certain workloads, do you take advantage of that? Thank you. So the rapid scaling system, of course, is fully configurable and uh, the customer decides based on the characteristics of the workload what uh, kind of instance they want to use. They, each customer has the favorite instance, so they will say, okay, if uh, I like the Z1Ds, other customers like the C5s, and we will just uh, satisfy the requirement based on what the customer configuration is. We'll see, oh, hey, the mic actually works. Anyway. Uh, the question I want to ask is, I really like your real-time cost tracking, and I'm wondering, is this pulling Amazon so that when they change their prices, this gets updated, or how, because these prices change over time, does your system support that? So we do have a API to the pricing subsystem in Amazon. We get uh, the price of the instances, the on-demand price, kind of once, we haven't seen it change it all the time. We sample the spot pricing every hour. So we can bid correctly every hour. Is that enough? I don't know yet, we'll see. We'll, uh, and I think you know it's one command to update the price tables. We'll put it maybe on a monthly schedule or something like that, or, or on demand, yeah. Going once. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Right. Right. Thank you.